Hello, this is Robert Rickover at Body Learning, and today my guest is Jessica Wolf, who is an Alexander Technique teacher in New York City. She teaches uh, in the Union Square area. Um, she also teaches at the Yale School of Drama in New Haven, Connecticut. She's been a teacher for over 30 years. Um, Jessica's specialty is breathing. Yeah, how, and she has worked worked for a long time with Carl Stau, who is a, a man who dedicated his career to research and discoveries in respiratory science. And she is one of 11 practitioners who were given permission to teach his, his method. Um, she has, in recent years, developed... Um, a body of work which she calls the art of breathing and she has been training Alexander technique teachers in this a kind of a postgraduate training program um, and we're going to talk today about uh, how how this emerged and how she works with people with breathing uh, Jessica welcome to the show thanks Robert Good to be here. Could you begin by just letting, uh, giving our listeners a short description of the Alexander Technique? Sure. Um, I, th I think the Alexander Technique is really about learning how to use yourself more efficiently and more effectively and um, how to let go of the excess tensions on, in the body and how to coordinate the body, how to do whatever you do with a little more efficiency. Mm -hmm. And what is it that drew you to a, a special interest in, in breathing? Well, I, I think that um, it's indispensable. It's what we do all the time. It keeps us alive. And um, I, in particular, had tremendous problems with my breath. I had been in a car accident when I was still in high school and um, hurt myself so that I whiplashed my neck. But in addition to whiplashing my neck, I strained some of my vocal cords and just the entire breathing apparatus through my throat was in trauma. And so for a few years, I walked around struggling with the breath, efforting my breath, creating a lot of tension just whenever I had to think about my breath. And you don't want to have to think about your breath. Your breath is involuntary. So I was lucky enough to find the Alexander Technique when I was finishing my college education. And um, I studied and I started to take private Alexander lessons twice a week for about six months. And within three months, I felt like I was a different person. I had a different attitude because I didn't have pain and I wasn't struggling to breathe. And, uh, and then from there, three months more down the road, I was really interested in it. And my Alexander teacher, a woman named Rachel Zahn, said to me, why don't you train to be a teacher? And at that point, I didn't have the foggiest idea of what that was going to be or how I could possibly be a teacher of the technique. But I was pleased that she thought that maybe I, I would be interested and... Um, I stepped right up and trained to be an Alexander teacher. Wow! So the you know the Alexander technique is is known uh, for helping people with breathing in general. Alexander himself, his original issue that caused him to make the that led to the discoveries of the technique certainly included breathing and and um, and and speaking. But breathing was a big part of his issue. Um, what, what is it that led you, uh, to go beyond the technique, as it were, to the work of, uh, of Carl, Carl Stahl? Well, you know, Alexander actually called himself the breathing man. And his original discovery, as you said, was in respiratory re-education. Hmm. I was, um, trained to be an Alexander teacher. And unfortunately, I didn't get enough of my questions answered. I didn't have enough experience with the breath during training. 
I was fortunate enough to find Carl Stow, um, who was also practicing in New York City, and gave myself as a gift a session with Carl Stow after graduating from training. And um, I was very interested in what he was doing. He was identifying the diaphragm as the primary muscle of coordination for the entire body. And he was a man who had worked with emphysemic patients, very, very famous singers who were pursuing opera careers in the opera, and also um, the very finest athletes who needed to be proficient. He was working with athletes from the United States Olympics team who were working on running in altitude for the 1968 Olympics in Mexico City. So this man was looking at the act of breathing in all different realms. Mm -hmm. So he, in a sense, it was a, a it was a more specialized study on your part, something that would not normally be taught in a typical Alexander Technique teacher training course. Would that be fair to say? That is fair to say. Although I'm happy also to say that there is um, a lot of interest in the work, and there are numbers of teachers now who've been trained in the work that I teach called The Art of Breathing, and many of them are introducing it into their training programs in the United States. Mm -hmm. So um, could you say in general how you work with people? If someone comes to you, uh, let's say, for an Alexander, for Alexander lessons, uh, would you typically also introduce them to your more specialized breathing work, or is that a separate thing? No, it is not separate, because there's no way you can um, separate the breath from the body or the thought. Breathing is so fundamental that it supports our, our physical bodies. So that may sound somewhat esoteric, but it's really that internal ongoing shape change, that turnover of air that allows the body to feel a certain amount of freedom and ease. Um, I also think that the breath is the um, integrity for balance. If we hold our breath, we more easily have to grab to catch ourselves from falling off balance. Um, I also think that the breath connects the body parts for a dynamic alignment. So when I'm teaching, I'm always integrating breath with body and thinking. And I'd like to ask people right off about considering what, what they're thinking about their breath is, just as I might ask a, a student to consider what they're thinking about their physical body is in relationship to an activity, say, sitting at a desk, moving forward towards a computer. So... Um, I'll ask them to check in with themselves, and if they are, let's say, sitting in a position at their computer, imagining that they're in relationship to, um, to their desk, I ask them to notice where the tension is in their body, and um, to notice what body parts are, are more prevalent, or more th that they're thinking about, what are they ignoring. Of course, some people can't answer these questions, but I kind of guide them and coax them into thinking this way. And then, of course, as soon as I uh, begin to get responses about, you know, holding the breath or tightening in the legs, the base of the neck hurts or the shoulders are tight, then as I go to put my hands on, I put hands on. Alexander teachers have a very specific way of putting hands on. I put my hands on my student's head around their neck, maybe a hand on the upper back or some place towards the bottom of the torso at the pelvis. And I ask them to consider themselves three-dimensionally, taking away that old idea of being flat like a piece of paper front to back and to consider that inside the three-dimensional container, there is room for this ongoing breath. And as I ask them to think about their spines releasing into length from that compressed state, I remind them that their backs can respond to breath 
and movement as much as their fronts. And then I ask them to consider that when the head is not pressing down on the spine but has that easy balance at the top of the spine, that breath can come in through the nose or through the mouth much more effectively with much less effort. So that's how I connect the breath and the head and the the body and the thinking all together. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I've noticed a lot in working with students is that very few students have any idea of what actually goes on in their bodies when they breathe. Um, yeah, to, I mean, for that's sure. a, like an understatement, really. Um, <laughs> th- th- for just a, just one example would be the location of the diaphragm and what it does. Uh, people have very, very strange ideas about Amen. that, as I'm sure you've you've run into. In fact, one of the uh, pe- one of the musicians that I interviewed or, 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 or in, for an earlier podcast. Um, made the point that most musicians um, don't know anything about their, don't have any idea about how their body functions, except, she said, for singers who tend to have false information about it and ideas about support and breath control and so on. So is part of your teaching, to does it involve actually just giving people some basic information of where the diaphragm is, how it functions, what do the ribs do in breathing, that kind of thing? Absolutely. Just like I would give any student um, the information about where the head is balanced on the spine, I encourage people to begin to take a journey inside and to imagine that the diaphragm is, um, is, is three-dimensional, and that it functions all the way around, and that the motion for the breath is in the middle of the torso, and that it expands through the abdomen and through the ribs and the back, but that there is no lung in the belly. And so and there's many, no diaphragm in the belly either. And there's no diaphragm <laughs> in the belly. Right. So right. the diaphragm is a flexible dome that lies just beneath the lungs and the heart, and it separates the chest from the abdomen. Mm-hmm. And it's the muscle that's responsible for the filling and the emptying of the lungs. Mm-hmm. So when I, I ask people, where is the diaphragm, and somebody puts their hand on their belly and indicates spatially movement that's out and in, Mm -hmm. I know that I have a lot of information to give them on that anatomical, physical level. Mm -hmm. Because what I think is so important, Robert, is to locate the diaphragm in the midsection of the torso and to describe very specifically that the primary motion of the diaphragm is along the vertical dimension. It drops down on the in-breath, encouraging the lungs to fill with air, and it rises back up mid-torso on the exhale, encouraging the air to move out of the lungs. And of course, the intercostals and the abdominals and all the back muscles are equally important, but the diaphragm is the primary muscle of respiration, although it's not like most muscles. It's an involuntary muscle. And it lies on the cusp. I mean, we know that we have voluntary control of our breath. We can all hold our breath. But we know also that most of us don't ever spend any time thinking about breathing. We just accept the fact that the breath is going to be there for us. Mm-hmm. And it's only when we notice that we are, if we, we become aware that we're holding our breath that we begin to figure out, oh, this may be something that I do often. This may actually be a habit of the way I breathe. I hold my breath, and then I let it go. And a few minutes later, I notice I'm holding my breath again. So I really ask people to, um, to consider the involuntary nature of the breath. Mm-hmm. And it, I think another thing that another point that might be made here is that the diaphragm is an, is quite a powerful muscle, and if it's misused, um, it can exert pretty strong influences on our whole postural set. That's right. That's absolutely right. So, 
if if that diaphragm is working in a way that um, that is being pushed upon by the rest of the body, let's go back to this this image of sitting at a desk. Um, if I collapse my chest and my head pulls back a bit on my neck, there's going to be a downward pull in my body that puts pressure on the muscle of breathing. So that diaphragm doesn't get to have its excursion. It doesn't get to have that vertical movement range of motion that drops down to the bottom towards the bottom of the ribs and rises back up midsection because I'm pressing down. If I stand up and do that somewhat arching, super straight standing up, I tend to, again to lock my diaphragm. That's a lot of pressure in the body. Mm -hmm. When the diaphragm locks, tendency is for the ribs to absolutely brace. No mobility in the ribs. And for the belly to get hard and for the hips and the neck to lock. Mm -hmm. And you can, anybody listening to this can see plenty of examples of what you're talking about all around them. <laughs> it's not that uncommon. Um, it's interesting, um, a man named Walter Carrington, who was uh, one of the great Alexander teachers, he was trained by Alexander and taught in, in London for many years, ran a yes. training course there. Um, on a number of occasions, I, I heard him say uh, something to the effect that if if the breathing's going okay, that's a pretty good indicator that other things are going well with a a, a student. That's right. And, and I didn't really understand that when, when when I first heard it. I I didn't make that connection at the time. But later on, uh, when I when I had a little more training and a little more experience, I I I, I think I understand a lot more of what he's saying. But that leads me to a a question then. Um, Alexander teachers, uh, without any specialized breathing training, certainly work to help people improve their their coordination, uh, their functioning, and very often people notice changes in in their breathing with lessons could you say a word or two in general about what your work with carl stowe adds to the mix that that's not let's say in classical alexander teaching right because in no way am i implying that uh teachers who don't know this work aren't working with the breath. Everybody is. Um, I think that um, the, the work that I did with Carl taught me that there's a rhythmical functioning of the breath, which I interpreted as a support for what we talk about as primary control. Alexander teachers talk about a particular relationship of the head to the neck to the back. And I remember Walter Carrington talking about the breath fueling the length along the spine so that when we let our breath out, we can allow our breath to move up through our bodies and out our mouths or out our noses, have that orientation, that direction up along the spine. So I talk um, a lot about that. I also encourage... Um, the internal thinking about the actual bre our breath uh, supporting the muscular skeletal framework of our body and that a full three-dimensional torso relies on this um, ongoing breathing that Carl was trying to always get this turnover of air this easy exchange of air um, and I think that the particular focus on that ongoing exchange of air is something that I have learned to do that I don't think I would have learned if I had just done my Alexander training. Mm -hmm. And um, did he, when he would work with a, a student or a client, did he use his hands to help um, convey what he was teaching? Yes, and that's what that's what was interested me so much. Carl's hands were non-doing 
but directed hands, just as every Alexander teacher wishes their hands to be. Mm -hmm. um, he had a very clear sense of the ongoing movement of the breath. He could feel if somebody tensed in their belly to try to send the air out. And the moment that he would feel physical pressure underneath his hand that was resting on the abdomen, he would back off a little and take a look at the whole again, see the whole body working. Because the moment he felt pressure, he knew that the body would meet the pressure with additional force. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you meet pressure with force, everything braces and stops and therefore weakens the diaphragm. Mm -hmm. and, and basically, another way of saying that, I guess, is uh, you get in the way of a process that's designed to work very smoothly and efficiently. That's right. By creating uh, tension to, to perhaps push the air out or suck it in. That sort That's of thing. right. Yeah. That's right. right. And and I think his um, one of his most primary focuses is the idea that the diaphragm is meant to be in perpetual motion. Mm -hmm. That that e even at the extent at the um, extremes of of movement. Well, at the extremes of movement, it's different, but mm -hmm. he's talking about bringing somebody to a place of coordination mm -hmm. where the ongoing movement of the breath is happening so that it, at a very, you don't even know when the breath that just finished moving out is going to lead to that new breath that returns, that the in-breath and the out-breath just are so smooth that it's perpetual motion of the diaphragm. And of course, this is involuntary. It's not meant to be controlled. Mm -hmm. But we do have to, just like in Alexander lessons, we do have to bring it under conscious control. We have to recognize it. We have to become aware, both kinesthetically and intellectually, what it is that we're doing that is interfering with this perpetual motion. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's interesting, just listening to you just now, a lot of times with, with new students, I'll suggest if they want to see examples of really good Alexander use or the kind of use that the Alexander Technique uh, uh, promotes, to take a look at um, perhaps someone like Fred Astaire, uh, who, while he he did not have Alexander lessons, he does kind of exemplify a lot of what <laughs> we're what we're about. And I hadn't thought of this before. I I tell people turn off turn off the volume and just watch him move. Just ordinary mm -hmm. activities. Just don't get drawn into the plots of the movie, particularly for this. I mean, just to watch him walk or stand or sit or so on. But I think um, from listening to you, another thing that um, I'm sure you would see if you watched watched him is that, of course, he's breathing, but there's not there's never a big deal about it. The air is just coming in and out. And yes. I think that's very connected with the ease of his more obvious movements. I think the two are completely related. I agree. And I'm going to check that out. I'm going to watch one of his films. Yeah, you don't, um, you don't even need to look at the spectacular dance scenes. Right. It, it's actually more interesting for this to look at just very ordinary things. He's talking to someone. He's walking. He's getting up from a couch, whatever. Those are the kind of movements that if you watch him carefully, and you can do it in slow motion and so on, you will see an incredible smoothness, effortlessness of movement. And I'm going to guess that if you w look at his breathing, you're, you're hardly going to see anything because it's so subdued. It, 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 it does, there's no extra efforting involved. Well, I'm going to take a look at it. You know, the quality of the respiratory system is always deeply involved with every other system. You know, not just the muscular skeletal system, mm -hmm. but the circulatory system, the nervous system, the gastrointestinal, you know, or disorders that come from, um, you know, the stomach problems. Well, 
breathing. Alexander, FM Alexander, talked about the visceral massage of the breath. Absolutely, yeah. And when people have problems in their bellies and, you know, their stomachs are hurting, their digestion isn't as efficient as it could be, I think the breathing work is really helpful. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm I'm thinking this might, uh, unless you have something else you'd like to mention in this interview that we haven't touched on, this might be a good place to to bring the interview to an end, and then we're going to do at least one more interview with some specific exercises. Does that sound uh, okay with you? That sounds good. That so, sounds very good. Okay, so my guest uh, today has been Jessica Wolf, who's an Alexander Technique teacher of many, many years' experience, over 30 years, I believe. Uh, she teaches in New York City and the Union Square area, and she also uh, is on the faculty of the Yale School of Drama in New Haven. So if anything that we've talked about um, makes sense to you or interests you, uh, if you're in the New York area or if you're in New Haven, um, definitely uh, contact Jessica. We'll put a link to her website by the interview. And more generally, if if what we're talking about makes sense to you, find an Alexander teacher in your community and, and have a few lessons. And I'm willing to bet that in most cases your breathing will improve along with all sorts of, of other things as well. So, Jessica, thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you, Robert, and thank you so much for doing what you do. It's a, it's, um, a great contribution to the world. <laughs> well, thank you.